Russia continues military shakeups, and House Republicans demand answers over Pentagon financial accountability. All that and more today, July 14th, 2023. Good morning, early birds. I'm Zimone Perez, and this is the Early Bird Brief, produced by Defense News and Military Times. First up, a Russian general's dismissal is the latest evidence of cracks in Moscow's military leadership. Major General Ivan Popov has been relieved of his duties after speaking out about problems faced by his troops. It comes just weeks after a short-lived rebellion by mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin. Popov said in an audio statement to his troops on Wednesday night that he was dismissed after a meeting with the country's military brass. He described his dismissal as a, quote, treacherous stab in the back to Russian forces in Ukraine. He said the military leadership was angered by his frank talk about challenges his forces faced. He spoke about shortages of radars tracking enemy artillery that has led to massive Russian casualties. The former general encouraged his soldiers to come directly to him with any problems. That's an easygoing approach in contrast to the stiff style of command in the Russian military. Russian military bloggers say he's widely known for avoiding unnecessary losses, and that's unlike other commanders who are eager to sacrifice their soldiers to report successes on the battlefield. The first deputy speaker of the upper house of Russia's parliament strongly backed the general. Another parliamentarian said the defense ministry should deal with the issues Popov has voiced. Popov's dismissal amounted to another loss for Russia's troops on the front lines. Lieutenant General Oleg Tusikov was killed Tuesday by a Ukrainian missile strike. General Staff Chief General Valery Gerasimov was reportedly upset about Popov's suggestion to rotate his troops, who were exhausted after weeks of fighting Ukraine's counteroffensive. And a content warning for our next story, this next segment contains mentions of sexual assault and harassment. In another important story, a retired Army colonel reached a court settlement for nearly $1 million in a sexual assault lawsuit against a former senior military official. Army Colonel Catherine Spletsdozer filed the lawsuit. In 2017, she served as an aide to Air Force General John Hayden, who served as vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Spletsdozer said Hayden subjected her to a series of unwanted sexual advances by kissing, hugging, and rubbing up against her in 2017. She told reporters that she repeatedly rejected his advances and he tried to derail her military career after she rebuffed him. Hayden denied her allegations during a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing in July 2019. It has been a painful time for me and my family, but I want to state to you and to the American people in the strongest possible terms that these allegations are false. There, were, there, were, there was a very extensive, thorough investigation that Dr. Wilson described, which revealed the truth. Nothing happened, ever. An internal Air Force investigation determined that there was insufficient evidence to charge him or recommend discipline. And a senior Air Force official said that at the time that investigators also found no evidence Splitzdozer was lying. Hayden's nomination was delayed for months while senators investigated the claim. The Senate voted 75 to 22 to confirm him. That reflected a bit more opposition than most military nominations that usually get near unanimous support. Here's why it matters. The number of reported sexual assaults in the military has increased nearly every year since 2006. Sexual assault still remains highly unreported, even as policymakers work to make it easier and safer for service members to come forward. The federal government will pay Splitstozer $975,000 in a settlement reached in California. Her attorney said this is the only known settlement paid by the government for a sexual assault case brought against a member of the U.S. military. The settlement ends more than four years of investigations, reviews, and congressional digging into the matter. Hayden served two years as vice chair and did not seek a second term. In other news, Republican lawmakers are looking into the Pentagon's track record of failing its audits. For more on this, Defense News Capitol Hill reporter Brian Harris joins us today from the Capitol. So, Brian, the Defense Department is getting some heat from lawmakers about its financial accountability. What are lawmakers looking into exactly in these hearings? Yes, so the House Oversight Committee, uh, specifically the National Security Subcommittee, convened a hearing on financial accountability at the Pentagon, and their whole rationale for doing that, um, as is very commonly known, the Defense Department is the largest part of discretionary spending 
but it has never passed an audit. And in fact, it's failed five audits. Lawmakers really wanted to drill down to that. And, you know, it's a lot of Democrats critical of defense spending have raised this point before multiple times. It's not a new point by any means. Uh, what's interesting now is that you have a Republican House and that it was House Republicans that decided to do this. And what has been the Defense Department's response to these claims by lawmakers? Well, so one thing to note at the top here is they had this hearing, but they didn't actually have someone from the Pentagon Comptroller's office. Glenn Grothman, who's chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight, uh, said that everyone from the Comptroller's office was on vacation. That didn't really give DOD as much as an opportunity as they could have had to provide a satisfying answer. Um, one, there is an official from the Pentagon Inspector General and the one Pentagon official that was there um, was the principal director for pricing and contracting. And one thing he pointed to a couple times in the hearing for not being able to pass an audit was the slow pace of divesting from legacy systems. So basically you have all these old systems lying around that aren't as well accounted for. So I'm sure that's not the only reason, but uh, that was probably the one that came up the most. And again, you know, having people from the comptroller's office not being there was probably not all that helpful in terms of you know, getting like a holistic overview for the committee on, you know, the repeated failures to pass an audit. How does this play into the broader political fights on the Hill? From what I understand, there has been a lot of debate over defense spending within the Republican conference, right? Right. So one important thing to note about that is uh, for the context here, the defense top line this year has all very much been set by the debt ceiling agreement. And actually, so the debt ceiling agreement itself, it grows the defense budget to $886 billion, albeit under the rate of inflation. Meanwhile, it um, cuts a lot of domestic spending to the point where you know, defense spending has been roughly half the discretionary budget. Now it will be more um, under the debt ceiling be- deal, um, even with this 800, more than the non-defense side under the debt ceiling deal. A lot of Republican defense hawks, which is more the uh, dominant ethos among the party in the Senate right now, is saying is, yes, this $886 billion that locks in Joe Biden's, President Joe Biden's defense budget proposal, Uh, but it still falls below the rate of inflation, so they say it's inadequate. And what they want to do, and, you know, they have some Democratic support with this. Senator Reid, Jack Reid, the Armed Services Committee chairman in the Senate, supports doing this. They want to increase the defense spending for next year by using supplemental spending to get around the debt ceiling caps. And there's been talk of a few ways to do that, um, you, you know, mainly perhaps putting it on the Ukraine aid package they expect they'll have to pass in a few months. Uh, the specifics are still a bit unclear right now, but, you know, it's the very stark contrast here is you have someone like Mitch McConnell in the Senate who very much supports this. He's an old school defense hawk. But what we've seen in the House is Speaker Kevin McCarthy has kind of taken the conservative fiscal hawk freedom caucus side which says, and you heard this at the oversight hearing again, a lot of these people, you, you know, like Congressman Biggs are, are saying the defense uh, spending is a part of our big national debt problem. Um, and McCarthy a few months ago just kept shooting down to reporters this idea of increasing uh, supplemental spending. Um, so it's a bit of a McCarthy-McConnell showdown. And it also shows just more generally the sway the Freedom Caucus types have had over McCarthy and House leadership in that, you know, bleeds into the fence spending. Thanks, Bryant. For more conversations like that one, please like and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Also on your radar for today, the Justice Department is appealing the prison sentence given to the founder of the far-right Oath Keepers for actions during the January 6th insurrection. Founder Stuart Rhodes received an 18-year sentence for seditious conspiracy and other convictions. It was the longest sentence that has been handed down so far in more than 1,000 capital riot cases. But it was below the recommended range under federal guidelines and less than the 25 years the Justice Department requested. Defendants routinely appeal their convictions and sentences. It is more unusual, though, for prosecutors to challenge the length of a prison term imposed by judges. 
Rhodes attorney called the government decision to appeal, quote, surprising. Rhodes claimed to be a, quote, political prisoner during his sentencing hearing in May. He criticized prosecutors and the Biden administration as he tried to play down his actions on January 6th. The Justice Department filed notices in court that they intend to appeal the sentences of other Oath Keepers as well. And now here are some other stories that we're hearing chirps about. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said in an interview with CNN that Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville holds on hundreds of senior military nominations are a national security issue. CNN is also reporting that a Russian Navy ship docked in Cuba this week. It is the first official visit by a Russian naval vessel to Cuba in years. And leaders from Sudan's seven neighboring countries met in Cairo yesterday for the most high-profile peace talks since conflict erupted across the African country in mid-April. And on this day in history in 1789, French revolutionaries stormed the Bastille prison. Today is now known as Bastille Day. That's it for us this morning. To get more top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted and produced by me, Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode features stories by the Associated Press and Bryant Harris. Our editor-in-chief is Mike Bruce. Have a great day.